Hello and welcome to our 18th CCF webinar. I'm Kathy Manley, CCF Legal Director, and today we are looking at CMUs or Communication Management Units. CMUs are special federal prison units which were set up mainly for Muslims unfairly convicted in post 9-11 so-called terrorism cases. A few prisoners were grabbed from their cells in the middle of the night in December 2006 and taken to Terre Haute, Indiana, right in the middle of the country and where the death penalty uh, people are held. This was the first of two CMUs. One of those first prisoners was Dr. Rafael Dafir, an Iraqi American oncologist who was unfairly sentenced to 23 years for setting up a charity to help sick and destitute children hurt by the sanctions against Saddam Hussein. He wasn't even charged with anything related to terrorism, but ended up in the CMU anyway. Maybe the worst part of the CMUs is that no contact visits with family members are allowed. So the family has to travel often thousands of miles to Indiana or Illinois, only to sit in a tiny room and speak to their loved ones over the phone and look through plexiglass. Often these visits are cut short or canceled altogether. And also the phone calls are extremely limited. Most federal prisoners get 300 minutes of calls um, every month, I believe. And uh, CMU, you only get one or two, I think 15 minute phone calls a week and it can be limited even more than that. Um, and there's very many other unfair conditions faced by people in the CMUs. Also prisoners are supposed to be placed within 500 miles of their family, but the CMUs are almost always farther away than that. We are joined today by two former CMU prisoners, Yasin Araf and Daniel McGowan, and also by Rachel Mirapol, the attorney with CCR, Center for Constitutional Rights, who brought a long running lawsuit challenging the CMUs. Yasin and Daniel were plaintiffs in that case. Very unfortunately, the lawsuit was just recently dismissed with the court essentially deciding that CMU prisoners had no right to due process to challenge why they were put in the CMU, to try to get transferred out of it, or to challenge any of the CMU conditions. While the lawsuit was dismissed, when it was filed years ago, the Bureau of Prisons did start transferring people out of the CMU and allowed some more, some more minutes of phone calls. So it did have a positive effect on people's lives. Still, the CMUs were set up improperly and we believe they violate due process and should be shut down or at least run very differently. First, I wanna bring in Daniel McGowan, who now works for the ACLU and is involved in a lot of activism around prisoners. He's a former CMU prisoner. Welcome, Daniel. And can you tell us first, why do you think you were put in the CMU? And unmute. Sorry, I, I haven't gotten better at that uh, unmuting thing. Um, hi, um, my name is Daniel McGowan. I'm, I'm from Queens, New York. Um, like Kathy said, I currently work for the ACLU doing uh, jail and prison litigation. Uh, and I also work with a number of political prisoners and uh, a few different organizations, including Certain Days Calendar Collective and New York City Books to Bars. And uh, it's nice to see everyone. I appreciate everyone logging on to this webinar on a Friday afternoon. Um, well, the notice of transfer that I received from the prison staff at Marion uh, said that it was my conviction and that I was a member of the Earth Liberation Front and also, of course, you know, terrorism, which is just the word that's used to allow the government to do whatever the hell they want. Um, the uh, notice I got, actually, I have the lingo here. I'll read it briefly. It says your offense conduct included acts of arson, attempted arson, and conspiracy to commit arson. You have been identified as a member and leader in the ELF and ALF groups considered domestic terror organizations. Uh, your offense conduct included communicating in code and teaching others how to commit crimes of arson. Your actions have the primary purpose to influence and affect the conduct of government, commerce, et cetera, by means of force, violence, sabotage, destruction of property. So your contact with persons in the community requires heightened controls and review. So there's a lot that could be said about that nonsensical paragraph. Most, much of it is essentially language lifted from the federal crime of terrorism enhancement to buoy their arguments that I'm a cold-hearted terrorist. Um, after gaining discovery in the RF case, uh, it, was, it became clear that a lot of the reason I was sent there, while the terrorism enhancement may have made me vulnerable to placement in a place like the CMU, it was really had a lot to do with uh, writings on a blog that I maintained. Uh, my friends 
posted for me and uh, master's degree work that I was doing with Antioch University, just kind of writing critically about environmentalism and sociology and such. Um, yeah, and ironically, we uh, when I had a hearing about the terrorism enhancement door in my case, we we knew of the CMU's existence, and I made the argument, or my my lawyers made the argument then, that giving me the terrorism enhancement uh, would would essentially leave me vulnerable to placement at places like the CMU and ADX, for instance. Um, and you know, of course, I was given the terrorism enhancement, and when the government was seeking uh, candidates for placement in CMU, I was I guess nominated uh, by somebody at FCI Sandstone, which was a low security prison that I was at for nine months, uh, in which my contact with persons in the community uh, was not an issue at all until it was when it suited the Bureau of Prisons, which is a common theme. Okay, so so really a lot of why you actually were there, you think, is because of what should have been First Amendment protected speech, is that right? Your writings? Yes, I believe so. I mean, I, I think that I, I never got an incident report while I was inside. And it was because essentially what I was doing was following all their absurd rules. And, um, you know, writing about, I mean, my articles were not advocacy of criminal behavior or direct action tactics. It was, it was talking about meeting people from Mexico that were arrested multiple times for crossing imaginary lines in the desert and, uh, meeting people that, uh, you know, we're in at the time, this is before the crack reform. So it was people that were in on serious life sentences for crack and methamphetamines. So I was writing about a lot of things that I hadn't previously given a tremendous amount of thought to. And it was published on, uh, you know, publicly accessible blog and not really, in my opinion, a big deal. Um, but I think that when they wanted to fill up the new CMU and they wanted to perhaps, uh, you know, have 5% or 10% that were not Muslim, that uh, they looked to people with so-called terrorism cases to populate it. Yeah, all right. And can you tell us a little bit about um, the background of the CMUs and how they were set up? Sure. Um, I first became aware of the CMU in this weird way. Um, I believe it was, yes, I was being, I was indicted in New York, in Oregon and I was arrested in Brooklyn. And so I was shipped in on just uh, December 2005 across the country on Con Air. There's a series of planes and, and buses and such. And um, as it turns out, FCI Terra Hut is also a transit, like a regional transit unit before you get to Oklahoma, the main transfer center. And so I actually came into FCI Terra Hut's uh, you know, transit unit, and we we went right past the CMU, and of course the guards had to be like, "Hey, there's a terrorist unit," and you know, all I saw were essentially like about ten men with beards, you know, behind like a recreational area, like checking out the bus. Because as I was to find out later, the CMU is pretty boring, and when a new bus comes in and something happens, you you know, you go and you see what's happening. Uh, so I I heard I saw it then, and then uh, in preparation for my terrorism enhancement hearing, I had a number of people send me a you know alarming emails about, hey, did you hear they have this horrible unit? And this is, you know, what it was, a, a man at the Washington Post, I think, broke the story in, you know, in, in like early 2006 about these these units or late 2006, that these units were open or, or the unit, the one at Terra Hill was open. And so, of course, I went into, you know, during my case, I always thought, okay, well, this is a place I can end up. And then as it, as it turned out, I was designated to a low security prison, but then um, ended up after nine months there being sent to the CMU after you wrote these things on the blogs and yeah like uh, something like 24 articles about politics and prison life mostly mm -hmm. can you talk um about the kinds of prisoners that were placed in the cmus over the years or the sorry did i not i don't think i answered your question did you ask me how the cmus were set oh. up no, so yeah, sorry. I guess you didn't get to that. Yes, no, it, I didn't yes, at all. About that. You're I'm right. so sorry. Uh, there's you. so no, much please. to say on this. I, I don't want to blab, but um, so I get. I guess what I was getting at is during that time period, uh, the George Bush's Attorney General or uh, George Bush released um, a uh, the Bureau of Prisons under George Bush released uh, a thing called limited communication for terrorist inmates. And so these changes to the law were made in response to criticism by the, I think we found out later, the inspector general or the office of the inspector general, that the Bureau of Prisons have not been adequately monitoring communications between so-called terrorist prisoners in the United States and prisoners that are convicted of terrorist 
offenses uh, abroad. And they specifically, I think, identified that people that were involved in the 1993 World Trade Center uh, conviction uh, were sending letters to people abroad. And so their quote is, by concentrating resources in this fashion, it'll greatly enhance the agency, that's the Bureau of Prisons, capabilities for language translation, content analysis, and intelligence sharing. So there was a wave of, of negative uh, communication or negative um, responses from groups like CCR and the ACLU and others, including individuals that were just opposed to it. So it looked like the Bureau, they just never did anything with it. And we thought, okay, well, dodge the bullet occasionally that happens. And, uh, but then the, in December, 2006, the, the communication management was opened at the communication management unit was open at uh, FCI Terra Hut in, like you said, the former death row D unit, uh, which had been shuttered for a few years and by all accounts was quite disgusting when they opened it. Um, and then the CMU at USP Marion opened in 2008 in I unit, which was the former control unit um, when that prison was a maximum security prison. It's where they basically put people to just bury them. So, um, mm -hmm. so yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, sorry about not getting into that one before. Yeah, no, thanks for remembering that. Um can you tell us a little bit about, um, well, I, I should say first that um, a, a lot of people that were involved in actual terrorist acts or bombings or whatever um, are, don't go to the CMU generally. They generally get put in the ADX, the Supermax in Colorado. Yep. And there's also a bunch of people in the ADX who are in these fake preemptive crimes that we deal with too. Mm -hmm. So it's a bit arbitrary, sure. but um, can you talk a bit about who was at the CMU when you were there? Sure. Not um, necessarily exact identities. No, that's yeah. fine. I mean, I think yeah. I I think the list I made are all people that are no longer in the CMU because I just didn't feel comfortable putting people's business out there like that. Um, excuse me. So um, when I first got there, there were 18 people at Marion. Uh, apparently, it seemed that Terra Hut was was rather you know maybe more people, maybe 30 or so people. Um, the kind of cases you have are like. A lot of high profile cases so just some of the, the cases that i recall uh john walker lind was there at Terre Haute. there's uh most of the people from the holy land foundation case the charity case um adam hassoon and kifa jayusi the lakawana six uh you mentioned dr uh dr um walter bond an animal rights person richard scutari a white supremacist andrew stepanian from the stop huntington animal cruelty campaign uh, Abdulwali Musa, the so-called Somali pirate that is, uh, I guess that movie Captain Phillips is about, or about the incident he's indicted for. Uh, Khalid Awan, uh, Kurti Nix, uh, Nam Arnoat. There are like a mix of cases. And so you see people coming from material support of, of terrorism, terrorist organization cases, people that were convicted of helping Al-Qaeda, Hamas, Hezbollah, FARC. Uh, and from what I gathered after I, you know, I've been out of prison been out of the CMU for eight years, but uh, as far as I understand, there's people being sent for material aid to support ISIL as well, although I never knew anyone because that I got out before that group existed. Um, charity cases like the Holy Land Foundation, Adam Hassoun, I believe Arnaud is a charity case as well. And then uh, all these like sort of Fox News plot entrapment cases, they all have cute little names. Uh, I, you know, I think of, you know, the one from Dallas, a young man named Hossam Smadi. Uh, you know, the Los Angeles bomb plot in 2005, the Los Angeles Millennium Airport plot in 2001, the Buffalo Six, or I, I guess that would be the Lackawanna Six, uh, JFK Airport plot, the New York uh, City subway, um, Toledo, Virginia paintball network. There's just, I mean, it's all just like comic book shit, the way that, um, excuse me, the way that um, the prosecutors speak about these cases. I know them as like, Smadi and Farouk. I don't know them as like, you know, the nonsense in there in the, uh, you know, in the newspapers. Uh, then, there's it, also, I'm sorry. No, um, go ahead, finish what you were Thank saying. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, I, there's also a, a smattering of people that, um, that like myself, either have high profile cases or have terrorism, but it's unrelated. It's sort of the government considered domestic terrorism. There's a few people that, uh, you know, were in there for threatening judges or putting liens on federal judges. That's the sort of sovereign citizen, right wing, uniform commercial code people. They have these like novel, somewhat out there theories about the law and they sort of do things like put billion dollar liens on judges' personal property and things like that. And so I feel like they were put in there as a, like a, as a 
a way of trying to stop them, I suppose. There's some people who did phone scams, very few, but a few people. And then you have, um, you know, like there was a, a very high profile case of a, a person who was like, you know what, I don't even want to get into that. I'm sorry. <laughs> I just like put the brakes on. Rachel's okay. like, wow, you, you have brakes. That's amazing. <laughs> All right. Well, I just want to say that of the Muslims you mentioned, I'm familiar with most all of them. And I could talk about all those cases and how they were really unfair and how those people shouldn't have been in prison at all or for that length of time and shouldn't certainly shouldn't have been put in the CMU. Sure. Um, can you tell us what it was like for you there? What was the worst part for you? And just kind of generally describe the conditions that you faced there, in, I guess, Marion. Sure. Um, I mean, it, I had not had pre much experience with prison uh, before I, my case. I had like been arrested for like minor protest jail stuff, uh, never done any serious time. So I had acclimated to essentially a like a federal jail and then a low security prison at Sandstone. And despite being very far from my family and, and all the, the horrible parts of prison, I got used to that. You know, it's like, you have a track, you're able to walk out, get sun, um, work out, you know, play basketball, all these, these things that people think, I think, think that prisons are. Um, and the, the difference between Marion and that was quite stark. Um, I was told to, you know, pack my stuff up. I, I was given two boxes. I grabbed all my stuff, brought it to the, to the office and was told I was being put in the secure housing unit for the night. It was right before the bus left. Um, and then the next morning I was put on a bus to go to Marion. And of course, uh, I'm actually quite, I, I think I actually went to Terre Haute first. So I saw the, the CMU again. I saw the Terre Haute CMU like four times before I actually ended up there, which is bizarre. Um, so the thing that I felt when I first walked into the CMU was just the tightness. It's um, the Marion CMU at the time was like four hallways and you kind of come in and then you descend into it. So it's just, it, it's, uh, the ceilings are not very large, it's very tight. Um, it was essentially a control unit or like a long-term shoe or secure housing unit. So you feel just very tight. And at the time we only had like two hallways that were actually open. So even though it had room for 54, they put us on two wings because the prisons like to keep everything quite concentrated. It makes it easier for lazy guards that are just, you know, looking on porn on the computer or whatever they do during their shifts. Um, and so it's all very tight and concentrated. And then I remember when the door shut, it was just like this, like horrible, like ceiling slamming sound. And, and I remember thinking, oh man, I, people were doing laundry. You know, the, the thing is when you go into a new prison or a new unit, everyone is living their life and nobody has time for you. You're just like thrust with a bedroll and you're supposed to find out where you're supposed to go. So the concentration, the fact that we were on top of each other, the fact that I didn't recognize people um, you know, was, was a lot, um, you know, they described the CMU in this nonsense term, self-contained general population unit. It's like their little Orwellian way of saying that everything takes place in the unit, but it's general population, whereas general population is actually the prison, like where you interact with everyone. And then you go back to your housing unit and you go to a track and you go to education, which is in the library and you go to medical and you go to dental. When so when you need it and you go to the chapel for religious services this was all basically in one spot and so it was very rinky dink i mean every like there was a range in which we were told this is the cell for like books and there was like 20 books in there just nonsense you know mass market paperback stuff and um everything was held there it was medical dental education religious recreation even the disciplinary hearings were held in the counselor's office uh, the Mar Marion and Terre Haute both had their own internal shoe. So they had their own internal, like, secure housing unit for the unit. So when you, even when you got in trouble and you went to the shoe, you didn't even leave the unit. It was all there. And when you did leave the unit, it was this massive James Bond thing where they had to lock down the whole unit, which ultimately resulted in everyone on the compound hating you when you did come out there because you were the weirdo terrorist types that caused their game to end or their... And so you, you're released into an atmosphere when people are like automatically are predisposed to like not even liking you because, you know, prisoners, a lot of prisoners have conservative leanings or whatever, and they think terrorism and, and, you know, you're already dealing with that. Plus you've interfered with their life, which is, you know, not something you want to do. Um, do you want to talk about what the visits were like? Sure. Yeah. The other thing, I mean, sorry, I gotta, I gotta get through this. I understand. Here. I'm sorry about that. Okay. The, 
the, the major worst things then were visitation and, tele and the phone access. Uh, visitation, when I first got there, was two hours, um, uh, two hour visits twice a month. I think it, it doubled while the time I was there, still making it kind of hard to ask your family to come, you know, in my case, 1500 miles. The worst part about it, though, was it was no contact. And so when we when I first got to Marion, I was in this, you know, you got brought up to an area off the visiting room when the prisoners there didn't have their visitation and you just sat in this area that was, is, I mean, I used to be able to put my hands um, outward and touch both sides. And then the glass was like right in front of you. You had a telephone that you would use like a, a kind of janky, just barely working thing. And then you would be speaking to your visitor who sometimes I had two visitors and they would literally have to wedge the, the rubber or the plastic chairs into that space, like horrible. And then you were on the whim of, the electricity, if there was a storm and something went wrong, you just lost your visit. It was live monitored by people at the counter-terrorist unit in um, Martinsburg, West Virginia. So pretty bad. Um, I think the, the filing of the lawsuit caused uh, an expansion of some of that, um, including a new, newer space that was a little bigger, actually much bigger. Um, so that was, that was great. Um, I got used to, like Kathy said, 300 minutes a month during the holidays, the, the, you know, the December holidays, you get like another hundred minutes. And so people are on the phone all the time. And when you're that far away from home, you know, the phone is like a way to just try to keep your relationships going. So being reduced to like one phone call a week that you had to sign up for, like when I first got to marry and I had, couldn't make a phone call that week because it, it was already assigned because literally they have to make sure that somebody at the counter terrorist unit is sitting there live monitoring your phone. And so forget about it. If you missed one, if there was a storm and an electrical problem, you know, all phones are digital. So things get fried or whatever. Um, so I would say like that, that was the worst part. Um, my mail was severely restricted. My interaction with the media, um, interaction with friends. Um, it was a weird unit in that it was staffed by uh, one less person. Like essentially most units have like three people staff it and they do specific things. We had one person who was essentially like an investigator. So he did nothing for us except give us our mail because he was the conduit between the counter terrorist unit. So we would get mail, it would get scanned, it would get emailed. If it, in the best case scenario, we get it a day late in the worst case scenario, including some of the mail that was not in English. You talk about months, if not ever getting the mail. So the mail was a, a huge deal. And I got a, probably over 50 mail rejections for magazines and books while I was there. There's a lot more I can say, but I know you're pressed for time, so I'll shut up. Yeah, we may come back to you later right. if we have time, but um, okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd like to turn now to Yasin Arif. As many of you know, Yasin was the one who got me and all the other people in Project Salam and other people in Albany involved in this work. He was completely innocent, but unfairly convicted in a sting operation in 2006 and he served a 15 year sentence before being released and then deported to Iraqi Kurdistan last year. Yassin was sent to the Terre Haute CMU in 2007 and later was transferred to the second CMU in Marion, Illinois. Yassin, welcome. Can you talk about um, what it was like when you first got to the CMU and, and who else was there? Get to unmute yourself. You got to, there's a little button to unmute. Oh, there you go. No? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. And thank you, everybody, for coming on for this opportunity. Uh, I don't know about the first time I arrived there because my situation was little different, which is I was before in the county jail and in the same lockdown unit and single cell. So by the time I arrived there, it was the very, very small unit, but it was like I'm going back to the Middle East. I saw all these bearded men and most of them speaking Arabic and I saw the Arabic and religious books around. So I was kind of first few days kind of excited for the first time in two years, I can see some people so I can speak Arabic with them or I can some, see some Arabic religious book for me. And at the same time, it's kind of, I'm at least now outside of myself. But then after that, I realized when I hear from the other people, how's the prison it is in, the, in that country and how the other people's 
uh, having many, many writings and things to do daily and how we are on trap in the old buildings, small places, which is literally in the winter was kind of uh, feed water in the ground. And literally we used to uh, take rats out of our cells. And that was the place we are living. Rats? Rats out in our cells, literally. Ooh. Yeah. And it got really hot in the summer and really cold and other times, right? And uh, like from beginning, it was like that. There was no air conditioning there. So they gave us the small fan. We put it in the cell, but it was doing nothing in that weather. Yes. All right. So we're going to talk about the visits a little bit. Daniel talked a little bit about it, but I wanted you to describe if you remember the time when Steve Downs brought your two young sons then there to visit you early on, I think it was in 2007, and what happened with that visit? Yes, I just before that, I think if I understand well, it is the judge in this decision, he is kind of saying of any treatment is not rise to the level of torture, so it is fine and the kind of BOP can do it. And I was just thinking from this, that my third day I, I read about this decision. I'm just thinking, what is the definition of the torture or what's that judge thinking about the torture? Because we are human beings, we are not just the body. Sometimes the feeling and emotional, it's hurt more than the body. And kind of right now, just you asking me about that meeting. And I remember that day, Right now, is I'm shaking from inside. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. So right now, kind of, believe me, it is, it's all pain. Just think about that. Just remember that day. Just see your children like that. And then the judge say, there's no torture. I don't know what's the definition of the torture. Well, best I were understanding in Europe, even the single cell by itself is the torture. So I was surprised, but at that day, what's happened, as you know, I was far, far away from the Terre Haute, Indiana, and I kind of, my wife cannot drive that uh, far. And then Mr. Steve, Steve helped me to bring my children so I can at least see my children. He brought my both sons and he came there. So while we have the visit supposed to be for, I think at least four hours because that's the only visit I have. So we took it for every two weeks, they give us two hours. We took it for a month. We say at least we are going to be together for four hours, even if it is through the glasses, but at, at least I see them and they saw me and to make sure we are fine. So after they came in and we are talking by the phone, children crying from the other side, and just, hi, how are you? Uh, then Steve went back, so let the, me to talk to my children. And I thought he took out the paper, he wrote a note for himself. So I believe he wanted when he went, go back to say something about that visit or <laughs> what he told me or I told him, I don't know what he wrote in, in this. So they are, monitoring everything and they are watching from the camera after a while the guard knocked the door and he called Steve out then Steve came back and he said they want us to leave so what they want us to leave he said so we don't have even a, an hour at that time so at least we have three more hours leave where he said because they are saying that he he wrote something and he supposed have no any mean to monitor anything. So he told them, took the paper, take the paper and take the note he wrote, but leave, leave him there. They did not accept that. So I talked to Steve and I told him, please, even if he leave, just leave the children. They did not accept that too, because the children they are small and they need somebody to be with them. They need the guard to be with them. I say, so, okay, the guard let them sit there, but I want to talk to my children. They did not accept that too. So how much we try with them, there was no point. They say they need to leave. And I was thinking about this poor guy and these two 
child, they are driving almost two days because the first day from Albany, they did not arrive there. I think they stayed in Ohio somewhere in the, at night in the hotel. And the second day they are coming there to see me for at least four hours. After one hour, they cancel the visit and then they need to come back again to drive back 15 hours drive. So yeah. it is just something, something. And for what? What is the reason? Okay, what he wrote? This is the note taken. And he's, in the same time, he's my lawyer. It was not just like the friend and somebody unknown to us. So he was my lawyer. He had the right to be there with me and to oh. tell me what you're, you're breaking up a little bit. Let me just say what they said. Um, they said that Steve had to leave because he had no a recording right. device, right? At that point. Okay. No, they say because he wrote something. So they, they told him he is not allowed to monitor. So to bring anything with him, he understood that like the, uh, say, any recording advice. So what he brought, he had the pen with him and with the paper. So after he talked to me some, hi, how are you doing? And then I'm talking to my children. He went back in the same room and he sat on the plastic chair. He took out the pen to write for himself something to remember after that what he told me or what is uh, he saw in that place, usually to write about the meeting. So, and when they saw he is just using the pen and writing something, so they send the guard and they say they need to leave and they, they cancel the visit for that. Yeah, his understanding, which is normal, is that a recording device would be like a tape recorder. He tape had no recorder. idea they would think they would try to call a pen a recording device because usually attorneys can bring pens in to visits. He had no idea he couldn't bring a pen in. They didn't tell him that. So it was so unfair. And and then I remember one time when we all came with um, your wife and all the kids and visited um, and it was it was pretty difficult for her to see you under those conditions and then can you talk about that and then her decision to that it wasn't even worth coming to visit you under those conditions until you got out of the CMU it's it's hard one day I was talking to one of my friends there he just told me he say I seen we just turned to the wild animal I'm asking him why he he thought that, why he's saying that. He say, Yasin, ever you been in the zoo? When the people, they go to the zoo to see the wild animal, which is their danger, then they put them behind the glasses. He was thinking about how this wool affected even our children, what they must to think about their father why their father is that much danger, even they cannot go close to him. Why the window should be there? It is some, sometimes it is even child, always they try logically to find out the reason for things, you know? Yeah, that, that's terrible. I hadn't really it thought is, about it, is, it like it that. Is, this, uh, yeah, when we think about this, it's really, it is that they are telling that these are not people, are, are animals, are wild, are very dangerous, and they need to be separated. And you can see them through the window, like you go to the zoo. Of course, it is when my wife or my children, so they saw that, of course they are going to be affected. And then think about that, which is three days, come and go, drive 15 by 15, 30 hours, then to talk to somebody by the phone in the tiny room. So it is just the talk by phone. So why we go there? Let us just talk by phone once a week. Kind of seeing no point, seeing no difference, seeing no benefit from driving all the way there and then by the end talking through the phone and by the phone. From there, he kind of, she decided it will not, she will not come in back there. Even to be honest, myself never wanted her or even my children to come back there. 
<laughs> because each time we go there and we come back for a week, we are kind of like drunk. We are thinking about that. I still remember, you know, Hatam Faris. Yeah, he the day he up. came back, the day he came out of the visit, which is usually you should to be very happy. You saw my your, your children, your family, and that visit should give you energy till next time they come back because you survive by this love you get and you receive from your beloved one. He came back. He just he came out of the visit room and he's crying, crying, crying. For hours after that, we try with him. He's crying. I'm just asking what happened. He say his youngest son was keep telling the police, do you know who's that guy? That his father, he want to kiss me, he want to hug him. He say he was keep knocking that window. Daddy, I want a hug. God, Daddy, I want a hug. He said for two hours, three hours they are there. That kid is crying and asking for a hug. That sounds like torture. It, it, the judge is saying that's not torture, it's fine for them as it's, it's not uh, <laughs> rise to the level of torture. If it is that no torture, I don't know what's the torture. I, I, I promise you, which is that that man is broke and he was for a week, he's just talking about that uh, day and he's kind of remembering his son and he he's how he was trying hard. By the end, he said just before they leave, which is when they opened the door, he said he was not going with the police. He was keep coming to this side, knocking the door where they are put in Hatem. And he said, that's his father. He want to hug him. He want to hug him. And he left that way. OK. And then when you had the phone calls, you only got one phone call a week for quite a while, I believe. And, and how did that work? I think sometimes you called your kids at school. So that was the only call you got was calling their school. Is that right? I yes the whole the time I was in the terror hut it was one phone call a week then when after I arrived with uh, Marian and after indeed the CCR they put the uh, lawsuit after that they doubled the phone call to the twice a week and indeed it is not about fifteen minute a call it is about the one time call. So I was sometimes calling here, my country to my brothers or sister. And because the service here, if the phone, something happened, they are not hearing me and they close the phone, then I cannot call again. I have the window of half hour. If during that half hour, I cannot reach somebody or nobody answered, then I cannot call again. So that week I'm going to lose my phone call or if something happened and turn. And after that, it was, they added something electronically monitored. So if there's any background sound, like somebody else talking in that room and they automatically the machine hear the sound, this some background sound, they are going to turn off the phone. It was like that. Let me to tell you this real joke about that phone before I, I talk about something, uh, how I was connecting with my children. One day I was calling back here, my brother, and he was keep telling me he cannot hear, he cannot hear. And I'm keep going louder and louder and louder. Then Khalid Awan, he opened his cell door and he said, Yasin, put down the phone. I said, what? He said, put down the phone. I say. What he's talking about, I'm talking to my brother. They are in Iraq. He say, Yasin, if they are living on the Mars, they are going to hear you without the phone. If what? <laughs> if they are living on the moon, they are going oh. to hear you without the phone. You were too loud? <laughs> <laughs> I'm too loud. And he, he still keep telling me he cannot hear, he cannot hear. Wow. And this phone call, they put only the work day between eight o'clock in the morning till two o'clock afternoon, which is exactly when the children, they are in the school or when you call somebody, he's at work at that time. So if from eight o'clock to two o'clock, only during the daytime I call, how I should to reach my children? During that time they are at, at the school. So, but because they was in the private school, so, 
they let me to call there and every Friday I used to call there and to talk to them in the uh, in the school at the school. Okay. So you were the, the lead plaintiff in this CCR lawsuit. What was it like um, when you became a plaintiff? What was it like working with Rachel and the other attorneys? And then what happened with the CMU after the lawsuit was filed? You mentioned that a little bit, but I think things improved a bit. Uh, first, you let me to say thank you very much to CCR and every lawyer there, which is they really did the great job and they gave us a lot of time and they visited us many times and they filed motion on our behalf many times. So I'm very, very grateful to them. And I believe, which is maybe we lost the lawsuit in the court, but I believe we gain a lot and that lawsuit make the difference as soon they file. For example, while I was in the Terra Hut and we were asking for, for example, how we can get out of that. Literally, they used to tell us we need to finish our time there. There's no going out of, of the CMU. So after that lawsuit, what happened? They say, yeah, we are allowed to ask for moving from out from the CM. So that's something happened, I believe, because of lo that lawsuit. We was just one phone a week, which is after the lawsuit, they turn it to the two phone call a week. So we was two hours a visit, four hours for the month. They doubled, they turned to the eight hours for the month. All these changes, happened after the lawsuit. And I believe all was related to the lawsuit. Above all, there they try to better our situation. For example, in Marion, they open it to the door to another building and they give us three, four extra rooms in that building. We can use it for the recreation and we can use it for the education, for the classes. And between this building and that building where we are going out, we can see the sky before there was no sky. So just staying, just sometimes we used to just walk out of the CMU to we are appending to go to the another unit, just stay there and look at the sky and we are enjoying that. So they kind of, they make it the place little bigger. So all of these changes happen after that lawsuit. Plus, the people after that, they start applying for getting out of the CMU. And by the end, a lot of people, they came out of the CMU. And plus, I hear that now they added some kind of due process for sending the people there. All these changes happened because of that lawsuit. That's why I believe they did something good and helped a lot of people there, plus the education, which is a lot of people became aware of the places because of that lawsuit. And a lot of people may, they wrote to different people in the authority about that places, even reached to the many congressmen who they received the letter and they're aware about what's going on there. All of this happened, I believe, because of that lawsuit. So, no doubt, no doubt help it us if we do not gain it in the in the court. Okay, yes, thank you. Um, I need to turn to Rachel now. She actually has to leave at 3.30, so I wanna bring her in. Um, Rachel Mirapol is a senior staff attorney with the Center for Constitutional Rights and has worked on this CMU lawsuit for many years. Welcome, Rachel. Can you, um, I think we know why you wanted to file the lawsuit, but can you kind of describe what you were thinking when you were looking into filing it and what you were hoping would come out of it? Sure, absolutely. Um, and, and thank you for bringing me here. It's so amazing to be on a panel with you and with Daniel and Yassine. Um, it's the first time, Yassine, I think I've seen you since you've been out and it makes me so happy. Um, so, you know, we decided to file the lawsuit against the CMU because a lot of people inside the units were reaching out to us. Um, 
letting us know what was happening to them there um, and how upset they were. And we also heard a lot from family members of people inside the CMU and advocates of people who were in the CMU who let us know how important this issue was to the community at that moment. Um, and so that made us really want to take a closer look at what was happening. Um, in some ways, too, the, the, the way the units were structured was, was tailor made for CCR to challenge in that, you know, the Bureau of Prisons was bringing together Muslim political prisoners, environmental political prisoners, animal rights political prisoners, all these populations who we had been working for years to support. Um, and they were all brought together in this one illegal prison unit. So it was, it was obviously an, an important thing for us to get involved in. Um, you know, our goals in bringing the case, uh, I mean, at, at the bottom line was to shut these units down. We didn't believe that anyone should be held um, without contact visitation with their family. That is torture, that is cruel. No one deserves to be treated like that, regardless of whether they violated a prison rule or not. Um, but we also wanted to make sure that if the Bureau of Prisons was going to use a unit like this, they could not do it to sort of control the politics of prisoners, to control religious expression. Um, and that they couldn't do it on a whim with no evidence at all, without scrutiny of who was being moved to these units and why. We wanted to let the Bureau of Prisons know that people are watching, that people cared what happened to these men inside, um, that they are human beings inside and to give them a platform to share their writings and their ideas. Um, and finally, just as a, as a message of solidarity to say that this is wrong, the CMUs are wrong, we are watching, and we're not going to let this happen without, without speaking out against it. Well, I'm so glad you did bring that lawsuit, regardless of what legal decisions say, as, as Yassine described, it's already had a big impact on the people there, and uh, we'll see what, what happens to it in the future. But can you... Um, talk a little bit about how bad the law is on prisoner rights, how limited the right to due process is when you're in prison. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, due process for people in prison has two elements. First, you must show that you have a liberty interest in avoiding placement in a particular restrictive prison unit. Um, and if the prisoner doesn't have a liberty interest in avoiding a particular placement, then they are entitled to no process at all. They could be put in this restrictive unit for any reason or no reason. Um, and the court determines if one has a liberty interest in avoiding placement in a restrictive unit like a CMU by asking if that unit um, is a creates a significant and atypical hardship in comparison to the ordinary incidents of prison life. Um, and, and the law is really hard in this area. I mean, some courts have held that even placement in solitary confinement for months isn't a significant atypical hardship because so many prisons use solitary confinement. You know, so it's like the worst conditions there are in prisons across the country, the less process, the less procedural protections people in prison have access to. Um, now, once if, if an individual is able to establish that they have a liberty interest in avoiding a restrictive placement because the conditions in that in that unit are harsh, then the court will ask, well, do the procedures used to place this person in the unit and to review them um, for release from the unit, do they satisfy due process? So there's sort of these two different elements that someone has to prove to get protection, and that makes it incredibly hard. Um, to succeed in a due process challenge. It sure does. Um, can you talk about kind of the trajectory of the lawsuit over the years? Um, I think it was dismissed at one point before and then got partly reinstated on appeal. Is that right? That's right. Um, so we filed the lawsuit in 2010, over 10 years ago at this point. Um, and initially it had many plaintiffs, including family members of some of the CMU prisoners um, and many claims. For example, we had like an equal protection claim to challenge the fact that this was primarily a unit to control Muslim prisoners. Um, and, and that claim was dismissed early on, but even, even though we suspected that might be the case, it was important to, to challenge this unit for, for what it was and what the Bureau of Prisons was trying to do with it, to call this discrimination, even if we couldn't get it, get relief in the courts on that basis. Um, so over the years, the only claims that, that survived for some time um, were procedural due process and retaliation claims. And I'm gonna talk about 
the procedural due process mostly. Um, so our procedural due process claim did get to discovery and discovery is the time when lawyers have the opportunity to gather evidence. And this was essential because we spent years um, taking testimony from prison guards and the folks who were sort of in control of the unit and um, uh, collecting documents about how the units worked. And where we, we were able to create this evidentiary record to show that um, how harsh the prisons were to establish the liberty interest, show how harsh conditions of those units were. Um, and the, the story Yassine told about um, his friend's visit and, and the friend's son crying during that visit. He talked about that in his deposition and I put that excerpt from his deposition in every brief we filed to make the judges who reviewed this case hear the human impact of doing this to people. I remember sort of like reading the briefs, I would start to tear up every time I wrote, I read that segment to myself, but I wouldn't take it out because it was so essential to show just how absolutely torturous it is to keep people from their children in this way. Um, so uh, we were able to create uh, this evidentiary record to show that you know the the notice provided to people in the CMU um, that wasn't even the reason that the decision maker sent people to the CMU. The decision maker never wrote down his reasons for sending someone to the CMU. Rather, the reasons in the notice were the reasons the counterterrorism unit recommended placing an individual in the CMU. And even there, the counterterrorism unit wouldn't list all the reasons for their recommendation. As, as Daniel talked about, we know that you know, a lot of why he was re recommended for placement was his communication, and that was never listed on his notice of transfer. Um, so the individuals were not provided the kind of notice that due process requires. And, and um, who, was, who was the decision maker if it wasn't uh, the counterterrorism? Yeah, it was the regional director of the Bureau oh, of Prisons okay. at that point. Um, we were able to show that some individuals were given notice that was so vague it was meaningless. Like some of our clients got a notice that said something like, reliable evidence indicates your involvement in recruitment and radicalization. Well, when, who, where, what are you talking about? No detail whatsoever. Um, we were able to show that you know due process requires that individuals sent to a restrictive unit um, that deprives them of a liberty interest have a chance to challenge the factual basis for that placement. But when people like Daniel and Yassine and our other clients tried to point out factual errors in their notice of transfer, they were simply, you know, there was no substantive response. They were told, this is why you're there and, and that's all there is to it. Without acknowledging our Daniel and Yassine's and the others evidence that the notices were wrong, they were erroneous. They said facts that were simply and provably incorrect. Um, prisoners who have a liberty interest in avoiding a placement in a restrictive unit have the right to periodic review of that placement. Um, but as Yassine was talking about, for years, the Bureau of Prisons was lying to people in the CMU, saying you'll be reviewed for release after a year and a half of these units with clean conduct or telling some people you'll never be reviewed for release. Um, when really we found out that there was no process to consider individuals for release from the CMU. The Bureau of Prisons had opened the units just without creating that kind of process. They didn't know how to do it. So they lied to people and said they did. But for years and years, there was no process for release until we filed the lawsuit and then they started transferring people out. And even when they started transferring people out, um, men weren't told why they were being granted or denied a transfer. Due process requires reasons for a transfer denial and the men were given no explanation at all. So we created all these facts to show, we, we, um, we found all these facts to show that these units completely violate due process. Um, and, and despite that, um, you know, the case has gone up and down to the courts, as you said. So initially the district court judge, um, we and the Bureau of Prisons moved for summary judgment after discovery closed. And the district court judge initially granted summary judgment to defendants. And that basically means resolving the case without a trial based on the facts that both parties agree are true. And um, the judge granted defendants summary judgment um, saying there was no liberty interest in avoiding CMU placement. We appealed that up to the DC Circuit Court of Appeals and got a wonderful decision from the DC Circuit setting, um, setting it out that there is a liberty interest in avoiding CMU placement because of how harsh it is 
to be separated from your family and restricted in your communication for so many years, not just for a short period of time, but for so many years. Um, so after the circuit agreed with us, it sent the case back down to the district court judge to hear, to decide, do the procedures satisfy due process concerns? And um, it's that's the decision that we just got from the judge ruling that, um, that while individuals sent to the CMU are entitled to due process, um, the procedures that were used satisfy that. And I can talk more about sort of the details of that decision if you'd like. Yeah, just can you talk about the decision, how bad it was and, and what options you may be considering at this point? Yeah, absolutely. So what was so um, upsetting about the decision is that the district court judge ignored all the facts that we provided to her. Um, the opinion doesn't lay out the facts and say, you know, it's okay to have notice that doesn't reflect the reasons of the decision maker under the law, or it's okay to pretend there's a review process when there's not, or it's okay to have a, you know, a grievance process where you can't even challenge the facts that lead to your placement. Instead, those facts are just not mentioned in the opinion. They're completely ignored. There's no acknowledgement of the factual record that exists in this case. Um, and that is why the legal team is, is strongly inclined to appeal this decision. And it, it's a decision we will be making over the next few weeks. Um, but, but as I said here today, I think that you know, this struggle is not yet over when we cannot even get acknowledgement in a judicial decision of the factual record that, that exists and what has really happened in this case. Yeah, because I remember when that the discovery that you did, you worked so hard on for so for so long. And when I got to see all that, when it was released to the public on your CCR website, I was I was really blown away by it. It was so much I didn't even have time to read it all because I had been trying to research this stuff and I wasn't able to to get most of that information. I only heard little anecdotes here and there. So I really applaud you for doing all that work. And that was very valuable, regardless of what ends up happening with the lawsuit, but I hope that you do appeal and, you know, hopefully get another good decision from the DC circuit. Um, I don't know, but um, before you go, can you, um, I know Yasin mentioned this, but can you talk a bit about how the CMU did change um, after you filed the lawsuit? Yeah, well, I mean, that's that's sort of the most important piece that, that I take out of this um, is that just, you know, just by focusing attention on this issue, and this is so important as we struggle in so many areas um, around treatment of people in prison and in the prison system in general, just focusing attention on this issue, letting the Bureau of Prisons know that we are watching, we are all organized together, we all care about this issue. Um, they made a lot of changes, you know, they, they finally published regulations to set forth criteria for CMU placement and to create procedures about how people go in and out. Um, they started transferring people out. That's the biggest. Um, now people do get transferred out of the CMU after a year or two, usually. Um, they increased telephone time and visit time and they haven't decreased it, even though their, their own regulations contemplate much more restrictions. Um, so, you know, I do think that they have they have responded to this lawsuit by trying to clean up their act. It is not enough. It is nowhere near enough, but it is something. And, and we have all together, by being involved in this struggle for 10, 15 years, kept the CMU from being a black hole where people can just be disappeared. And that's incredibly important in itself. All right, well, thank you so much for your work on this, Rachel. Um, it's been wonderful having you on here. Um, I don't know if there's anything you wanna add before you leave. Um, sorry that you have to leave and then we can talk a little more um, with the other people. Yeah, I'm so sorry that I'm not gonna be able to stay on to answer questions. I have a phone call with a client who was recently released from prison after 30 years inside. So I know he will be anxious for me to be on time. Um, but thank you, Kathy, and thank you, CCF, and and you know, thank you, Daniel and Yassine for, for you, being Rachel. here and, and, and all of you. Thank it's so you. wonderful. Thank you. Okay. Hey, thank Bye y'all. Thank you very Bye. much. Congratulations to your client. <laughs> gotcha. All right. Let's Good. see if uh if we have any questions, um, we have some comments here. Um, let's see. Well, it just says, uh, we just have some comments from, um, let's see. Can I, can I say something about yeah, the, yeah, the, the impact? 
Um, yeah. I do want to. Those comments were from you, so you can say whatever you want, <laughs> and I won't read them. Yeah, I'm really big on the chat, I guess. Um, <laughs> so uh, I'll say that, like, for you know, when I was sent there, I had a considerable amount of time on my sentence remaining, and I had to get my head around the fact that I was like, oh yeah, okay, I'm going to be here till the end. Um, they made comments like that. Mostly, they made they made they kept us guessing the whole time. Originally, it was like the only way you're going to get you know, out of here is you go into the other unit, you know, the other at the time was Terra Hut. And I was like, well, I don't want to go to Terra Hut either. And then there was a period of time where when the government was buying Thompson, they were like, seriously considering opening up another CMU at Thompson. And I remember that investigative research specialist always messing with me and be like, oh, yeah, no, you're going to get out of here. We'll send you to Thompson because your co-defendant isn't there. And I was just like, I remember, you know, we filed the suit. They, they were clearly on our legal phone calls and listened to our legal visits because they moved one of the plaintiffs in the case the morning after it was filed. No, the morning he was moved, he was moved the day we, we filed it on March 30th. He was moved April 1st. And there was this like hubbub of activity that happened. Uh, they also announced that they were taking public comment on the day we filed. So they, th these things are just not coincidental. We never felt particularly secure in our communications when we were in there. The place, uh, you know, it sounds kooky, but the place seemed bugged. They seemed to know everything that was happening at all times. Now, that could also literally be people that are cooperating with the government, but I, we always had a sense like that these legal visits are not safe and they never were. But after it was filed, not only did one of the plaintiffs in the suit be moved right away, I was moved out not too much longer after that. And, um, you know, obviously the increase in the hours, the increase in the space, Yasin referenced the new building in Marion, which I never saw, but it was, they were scoping it out when I was there. And it definitely seemed uh, not really doing the right thing as much as just like, how can we get these people off our case? There is hostility to CCR. Um, you know, I, I wrote CCR, Rachel was actually on maternity break at the time for, I believe her first child, which it's a long time ago. And I remember talking to Andy Stepanian in, um, in his cell. And I noticed uh, a, a really pretty little brief, I guess, like when you file with the Supreme Court, you have to get like pay for the printer to put it in a nice little booklet. And it was an amicus brief. It was a friend of the court brief that CCR filed. And I, I had at that point sent out so many letters uh, you know, ask, begging everyone for help. And I finally was like, all right, I'm writing this Matt, Matthew Struger person. And I did, and then Matt ended up leaving the organization and Rachel became my, my uh, our attorney and we, we crafted this, this lawsuit together. Um, when it was in draft format, the case was called a Ref V Mukasey because that horrible monster Mukasey was the attorney general at the time. And I mean, when we're talking, it was literally been a Ref V Mukasey, Holder, Lynch, Sessions, and now Barr. And I think that shows you that whoever's in charge there, they're pretty much okay with this nonsense war on terror and, you know, the domestic manifestation of that, which is creating these crazy units where we put people in. So anyhow, I'll, I'll shut up. Now. Yeah, no, and I, I think you're probably right that it was probably bugged. And I know they had intelligence officers there and FBI had its own little unit there, which is, I thought that was so weird because these are all people that are sentenced. They shouldn't be interrogated. Like you don't usually go and interrogate prisoners after their sentence that may be sometimes but but i just want to mm. tell one little story question, about, yeah. um, that i an experience i had when i was visiting the Terre Haute cmu the first time i think it was the first time in um in late in the summer of 2007 there was a guard that was really friendly with me and his name was um tim coleman Oh, and to yeah. Me, right. And, and he was friendly. I just thought he's a guard and he's telling me these guys here are really good guys and that the people that need to be in prison are like George Bush and stuff. Right. That so was I bullshit. Thought, oh, that was pure you know, bullshit. He's a nice guy and he probably knows these guys in this unit and realizes they're good guys. And, you know, I just don't want to get him in trouble by using his name if I say, oh, there's this cool guard there. And, you know, so I was thinking positively toward him and um, I would arrange visits with him and uh, talk to him. Sometimes I would call him and ask questions and, and things like that. And then, and they would never give me his voicemail. Um, but one time I accidentally got put through to his voicemail and it said, Tim Coleman, intelligence analyst. Mm -hmm. And I went, Oh, okay. Tim Coleman worked for, worked I just, for, the, I, just, um, 
I just ignored it and left my message and pretended like I hadn't heard it, but he never called me back. He never talked to me again. So yeah. He was the investigative research specialist at, at Terre Haute when I left. And he was like Henry Rivas, the one at Marion. Oh. Uh, they were the, they were the conduit for a counter-terrorist unit. I one time received a uh, printout that was not meant for me in my book. And it was an email between one of those people and my, my intelligence analyst at counter-terrorist unit and they were they said they couldn't find this book online it was too obscure to like look amazon inside the pages you know so they literally fedex them my, this book and then the intelligence analyst presumably looked through it saw it was harmless and fedexed it back and that's kind of how they did things but tim coleman was a you know i mean everything he said was a lie i mean he was a he was a detective essentially like sis officer there yeah yeah, it was crazy. Um, Yasin, did you want to add anything, say anything else that you may have not gotten to say before? Oh, he's muted. Yeah, you got to unmute yourself again if you want to. Uh, sorry about that point that to have FBI agent in the unit, in the Terra Hut, in one point, he was coming and walking around in the unit. Then we have some people there, which is there was non-Muslim. When they saw that kind of, they say, no, demonstrated. They say, if we have the problem or getting in the trouble with the police, it's no problem. But if these people, they are going to, to give us the new charges. So we have the town meeting there. Uh, yeah. Starting to break up a little bit. Um, so let me ask one of these questions, and maybe you, you're um, when you're. Then I start to the to the for hello. Uh, your your sound was breaking up for a minute there. Try it again. Uh, sorry, maybe it's the service here. Yeah. So what happened? Then we have that meeting, and um, I I spoke to the warden. I say. Why this guy here? He say, it's no problem. You you don't have to talk to him. He's just walking around. I say, it's not about we are talking to them. If it was we are not talking or we are not doing anything, never we be in the trouble with them. In the first place, I will not be here because these people, they create things. And why he is here, he's looking around when somebody for some reason broke or kind of got mad then to call him and to to make him to do something or to become the kind of spine or something on us. So why he's around? And we have the, the right to be protected. After we, we got our sentencing, the judge sent us to the time. So we have the right here to be protected from these people to build another case against us. Yeah, so a lot we of kind years. of always say, no, we don't. Yeah, we, we say we don't want him here. So then after that, I think they opened another office outside the building for them. They was kind of just reviewing the camera and watching us from there. But he did not come after that to walk in the unit. And was that the FBI? There was a little yeah, FBI. Yeah, FBI, but in the Terra Hot, yes. In Terra Hot. Yeah. And uh, them, them, themselves, they, they kind of, they introduced it him to us. They say he's the FBI. Wow. If any, any of us, we need something or we need any help or we like to talk to him, we can go to his office. They want to open the office for him inside the, uh, the building there. Then we say no. We say we don't want to see this guy around because we are sure if they are here, they are looking for any opportunity to build another case against us. And then these people twist in our words. If not from the first place, we are not coming to the prison if these people are honest so, and if they leave us alone. So why they are here? And we, we have the right to be protected. So after that, he kind of, I think they opened the office outside the building for them and they was from there to monitoring us through the camera and other things. Yeah, as if it wasn't bad enough that the FBI, you know, wrongfully entrapped you and a lot of people in these 
fake sting operations then they show up in your prison too while you're serving your sentence that's crazy yeah. did you want to add anything to that daniel yeah i never uh the only thing i saw i had heard about about this taking place at Terre Haute. the only thing i had seen was uh once uh they had said that someone in the unit had a visit and i knew that that person had no one near them and so i was able to look out and see two guys in suits go into the visit area and they locked us in they never lock you in for a visit they just, you know, take the person to the visit area. They were like very strange for this visit. So I kind of already suspected this person was dirty. So um, there were people in the unit that were, you know, it's it's prison. People were trying to work off their case. And there was definitely uh, a lot of people cozying up to some of the people that were in CMU. And and I, I my red flags were going off, but those people never tried to talk to me about anything. And I had no interest in talking to them about my case or my future life plans. I didn't want to get accused of planning something that I uh, wasn't and, you know, being accused. So, you know, it's prison. There are people with long sentences that want to jump on your case is, is the phrase. And uh, I avoided them like the plague. Um, and, uh, you know, when I was getting out, I ended up getting a volunteer lawyer in Terre Haute because I, I didn't want to get harassed on the way out. And so I got a volunteer lawyer in Terre Haute that sent the CMU and the warden a letter saying don't even try to talk to him on the way out he's leaving for halfway house and you can contact me and it was just like a nice little courtesy to just feel like I can leave prison and be you know safe you know yeah yeah I remember when I was visiting seeing people in the visit line you know you go and sign in your name and sometimes they would write FBI next to their names so I was like oh they're here they're right there okay um so we had a question actually from Allah and um, Yassine's daughter who is asking about, and Daniel, you talked about this before, but how the, how the CMU was different from a regular general population, like low security unit. Yassine, do you want to talk about what it was like when you finally got out of the CMU and into the general population and then to a low security prison and how it was different? Oh, yes. That's the time I realized it, how bad was CMU. Hey. The first time when just I got out of the door in the Marian and they let me for about six months to stay in the Marian, but in general population. And I was thinking, remembering every single day from early morning till the nighttime, they locked down the unit. I was outside just laying down on the grasses, just playing handball. And after that, we start soccer. So Handball. just to go outside and to have the place to play, it is, you don't know how, 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 how big the difference will make between to sit in the room or to be in the basement and to stay in the same place forever and with the, a few people forever or just go outside every week, 50 new people come in, 50 new people going. So it is all every day changing the environment and situation there. It is just no way to compare it. It's just like now maybe many people because of this virus and Corona, they feel kind of what's mean just to stay at home. While they are staying at home, they're having access to the, all the world by the camera, by the internet, by phone, by all the means. And they have the satellite and they have foods they like to cook and everything. Just with that, they get tired just staying home for a few weeks. So imagine to stay in the places like this for 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 years without even all these means to, to be in your hands. We are kind of cut off from the world and then all of a sudden they open the door. It's kind of like half released for me just by getting out of the CMU to the... Uh, general population, it was like half release for me. I was just thinking I'm fine right now. Yeah, because you were able to go to Loretto and destroy everyone in handball, that's why. <laughs> and soccer, they would Best handball play player in CMU, I don't care what anyone says. He used to destroy me and frustrate me with these tight, he's just like putting it in the corner and just like me running around like a mad person trying to hit the ball. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, we have one other question or maybe a couple, but here's one, it's kind of a long question. It says, I'm friends with and work with the Muslim prisoner with the so-called terrorism charge and a prison journalist in a medium security prison. And I'm in, uh, in contact with the range of prisoners in federal prison. 
They have recently threatened one friend of mine that he would get a conspiracy charge if he didn't remove our email from his Corelinks account. We're dealing with a lot of surveillance, censorship, et cetera. Do you have recommendations for how to combat such censorship and threatening from the BOP? I don't know, Daniel, do you wanna talk about that a little bit? I don't know sure. I mean, it. it sounds like the BOP just puffing up and threatening, but take it seriously. If they're saying you're gonna get, a, you can get a conspiracy charge. My first question would be like, and you don't have to answer this, but to do what? I mean, is there an allegation that you are engaged in criminal conduct because you know, there's a difference between breaking a prison rule and a criminal charge. And so like, I would just like think long and hard about like what it is you're being accused of. And, and, and if it's like completely ridiculous and blown out, I mean, I don't know what they're accusing you of. I mean, they usually they get very persnickety about this idea that someone on the outside would be taking the words of someone on the inside and passing it on as if that's like some kind of like hocus pocus thing. Um, so I'm not really sure, you know, what that means but i would i would i mean you know it never hurts to talk to a lawyer but like it sounds like bop blowing smoke but i can't say that for certain not knowing really the facts and you don't i wouldn't suggest necessarily we're putting a lot more information out there about that but um the bop likes to threaten and they can they you know core links is a privilege and they can remove that pretty easily for for really minor uh things i i once got an incident report when i was inside and i i beat it and what it was was a person who was in prison in the UK wrote me a letter. I didn't really recognize their name. They were like an animal rights person. I added their name to um, to core links. Like you have to get the addresses approved. It wasn't approved. I never wrote them. And then I was looking in a magazine and I realized who it was. And I was like, I should probably delete that. I deleted it. And they gave me a shot for saying that I was in communication with another prisoner. But I'm like, you you guys gave me the mail. So like, if you're such a big, bad CMU, why are you giving me a mail from someone that's a prisoner in the UK? Like it didn't make a lot of sense to me. Um, so they like to, you know, threaten and stuff. And it could be that, or it could be something serious. I don't know who said that, who's threatening the charge. The BOP doesn't prosecute you. They would refer you to a US attorney for prosecution. And those grounds sound pretty flimsy, but I'm not a lawyer. So right. I don't have to deal with the consequences of what they're saying, so. And whoever, um, the person that submitted that comment can contact us at CCF and we can look into it more if you want. I do know of an, another person in who was, I think, well, he was in the CMU and they, they said recently that we, um, he got in trouble because they said you're committing crimes with your parents, which is completely ridiculous. He would just talk to them on the phone. There was no, I know there was no crimes going on and it was the same kind of threat. I don't even know what they we're referring yeah. to they can sometimes be very loose with their language like uh let's say your friend gave you some commissary and you wanted to pay him back and you asked your family to put money on his books like that's a pretty like that's what you do on the outside someone lends you money you pay them back but in the inside that is a huge like oh it's a conspiracy drug money and they they act very insane about just giving someone a donation or helping someone out they're they're not into, you're not allowed to share in the bureau of prisons yeah, there's a lot of not things a lot that wary people wouldn't be aware of could be a problem, certainly. Um, and people can contact us if they have questions about that. All right. Um, I think if we don't, we don't seem to have any other questions. I'll ask if there was one other somebody named Cindy was raising their hand. I don't know. Um, they didn't put the question in the chat, though. But yeah, I don't even know what that means raising their hand. I think you but, can do that as part of the webinar and then like you can but call I don't them, think but they I, can speak so they'd have to type their question so if Cindy if you want to type your question go ahead but meanwhile I will ask either of you if you have any closing thoughts for us and thank you both for being here is that <laughs> sorry just about the differences so how sometimes the little things will make the difference uh, in one point, when I was in the Raybrook, in Raybrook, freezing up, they don't let you to flush the toilet. They, uh, I didn't hear that. Can you say that again? Something about flushing the toilet? I see. I say when I was in the Raybrook, we are in the lockdown, so we are inside, but. We cannot flush the toilet. So out from the outside, CEO, police need to flush the toilet. 
Oh. First, I arrived there. I That's don't so know. bad. Can't hear you, Yassin. Um, Daniel, do you want to say anything and maybe Yassin can come back? If... Uh, so I stay warm. Oh. It's full and I don't know what he neglected. you. Just Edric. Okay. Okay, Daniel, go ahead. Uh, I just told someone about the, the concept of a dry cell the other day and how I was first arrested. I used the bathroom and I'm pushing the button and I'm like looking up at the camera and trying to point and then they flush it for you. But they do it on their time. So like you would prefer to do it right away. Obviously, you're in a tiny room and they do it whenever they want, which is, you know, and then I have to like be like, can I wash my hands? And I'm like miming at the camera, which is horrendous. Uh, no, my final thoughts, I appreciate you all having this and continuing to um, do this work, you know, many years after a lot of people have just decided they wanted to move on from the war on terror and the consequences uh, of that, uh, all these hundreds of people that are, that are incarcerated um, for us, uh, mostly entrapment and silly, silly made up cases by US attorneys. Um, and just in naming all the people we were talking about before, it's really nice to see a lot of people not only out of CMU, but a lot of the people we knew, you know, seen are out of prison. You know, I mean, I have a, a whole bunch of people. I see them on Facebook now, and it blows my mind that I'm, I'm getting, you know, like I think of like Hamid Hayat and Ali Chandia and Adam Hassoun and people like that are out. I just look so happy to see that some of it has been, you know, they did their full sentences, and then some of it has been like, you know, they changes to the law or, or whatever litigation. So thank you for everyone coming out. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you to both of you and to Rachel. Um, yeah, this was very informative and um and again, I'm also glad to see all the people being released finally. Totally. All right. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everyone. Done. Bye. Okay, Kathy. Thank you very much. Okay, done.